Perfect. All right. Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Ed Lallier, co-founder and chairman of Intent. I am pleased to uh, introduce uh, Michael Kelleher today, who will be our keynote speaker for Pitching to Investors. I uh, wanted to share with you, thank you, William, uh, and uh, I also have William Moore, who's going to be helping us out with uh, the technical aspects of today. Um, but I wanted to kind of provide some uh, initial oversight and, uh, and uh, you know, overview of uh, our program before we kick off uh, to Michael to kind of uh, talk us through how to pitch to investors. Um, so, um, you know, Intent itself is uh, a uh, graduate student entrepreneurship association. We were founded in 2017. We have since grown to have over 500 active members across all eight schools at Boston College. You know, our, our mission is to develop, train, and support uh, uh, and inspire uh, principled entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, uh, really grounded in Jesuit principles. So in short, what we're trying to do is create good moral leaders that make positive change in the community. And the way that we do that is through a suite of programs, which are all really designed to provide skills and networking opportunities for graduate students across all eight schools at BC to help you kind of pivot or go deeper into a career path that um, that you know, is you know uh, purposeful for you, that's meaningful to you, um, and the way that we can help you with that uh, is through workshops uh, uh, such as ones that we have tonight, uh, apprenticeships which are really helping out uh, startups that are in the local community, um, incubator. This is where you can take an idea that you have and we can help qualify that for you, and lastly, our accelerator program which is where you can take an already established idea and we can actually help build your team, your MVP and help scale your operating model. So you're ready to pitch to investors. So this uh, event today is really core to how we can actually help those who are inspiring entrepreneurs understand the process to actually tell a good story, to make it meaningful so you can really get buy-in from the right people to help fund your idea. And, and that's really important. When you're looking to take an idea and make it real, you, you're going to need to have friends. You're going to need to have partners. And selling that story is key to really make sure that everyone's on the same page. So I'd like to you know, introduce Michael, who has been uh, a, a good friend of, you know, for me and for our organization for a, a number of years. Um, he's you know, a um, current participant in our uh, apprenticeship program at Intent. He's a, a, our, one of our mentors for our accelerator and incubator programs. So, um, you know, he is um, a 2019 Mass Challenge finalist, um, which is really impressive. He's a, a co-founder of uh, Easy Mortgage Apps, which is a, um, a service that helps uh, the customer make it easy and, and stress-free to, you know, find a mortgage to like to buy a house. Is that, is that correct, Michael? Yeah. On a mobile device. So on a, mo on a mobile device, we make correct. mobile apps and you always pitch it so well, but yes, it's, it's that easy. All right. Um, and he's also the uh, chairman, I believe the co-chairman of the Massachusetts uh, mortgage. Uh, you know, the bankers association, yes, the, yeah. the technology committee. Yeah. So um, as you can tell, uh, Michael has got a lot of accolades. Um, he knows his business well. He's been in the financial services industry for 15 years, primarily in mortgage banking, and we're thrilled to have you on board. So uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, share my screen here. Who can share me? Okay. All right, so welcome everybody. I'm glad everybody's here. They say uh, you've already taken the first step showing up. Um, if everyone could write in the chat, uh, just real quick, uh, your name and either your, how about your name and where you think your headquarters will be for your company? I think that'd be a really cool um, way to start here. Let's see if we got some, some people in the chat. Looks like John's here. He's going to be in New York City, Alexandra, Boston, or Madrid. Uh, definitely a lot of niche products. Uh, Scott in Boston, Michelle, Pittsburgh. 
That's that's awesome, Pittsburgh. I'm sure that's an up and coming place. Uh, Hannah, Brooklyn. We got Vanta, Boston, and Honolulu. I've taken that flight. It's a uh, it's a long one, but definitely well worth it. Tanya, Boston. It's an exclamation point uh, to match the New York one. Louise, Louis, Boston, Atlanta. See, that's cool. So there's a lot of different people from from a lot of different places. Um, and I hope everybody's doing really well today. I think. You know, you, they always say like you just being here is really the first step. You're going to have to step up a lot um, if that is the case of, of where getting to where you want to go. And there'll be a lot of resources. As you can see, I've, I've been part of a lot of accelerators. This is one of them. But uh, Mass Challenge, Rev Up. So when I see Pittsburgh or Honolulu, there's definitely resources that are more valuable than ever. Uh, from an accelerator standpoint, I'm going to go through my presentation. I would say I'm more valuable on the Q&A part. Um, you can, I mean, YouTube's very powerful. So you can YouTube a lot of tips about how to uh, write the perfect pitch deck. I can tell you from the weeds, somebody that has been on the side of getting money and not getting money, uh, some of the things you want to go through. I've also bootstrapped uh, for over six years. Uh, so what that means is have had to sacrifice or make the best use out of resources. And so I have a lot of knowledge there. So I'll be happy to, um, to give you that. Uh, one more thing in the chat, if, if anybody can just put a big win for either the company they're starting or maybe something just personally at school or, or in their life that they've uh, encountered this week, I'd like to see some big wins before we get started here. What I'll do is, and while I'm telling you that, and this will give time for anybody else to jump on, I'm gonna jump through, there's about 22 slides. Uh, then I'm going to take you through a quick sample deck that's super easy, uh, really eye-catching, and then we'll open it up for Q&A here in the chat. Um, awesome. Somebody made a relocation there. So that's, uh, again, in that chat. Any any big wins? For me, I was able to launch a new app to, uh, into Test Flight. Test Flight's how you, if anybody's going to be in mobile app development for the iPhone, you get Test Flight. And then test flight is how you start uh, sampling the app. So that was a big win. We'll go back to the big wins. We're going to get started here. All right. So the big thing about pitch decks is you always have to remember that you're selling. You're selling your equity uh, for a price. So don't forget that. Um, and I personally have done that a lot uh, at different stages of our company. And there's been times where we were valued more. Uh, when we said no, then where we are today in times we were we were at less. So there's no exact right answer. Hindsight's always 2020, but there's one, um, or I should say a lot of the themes remain the same. Um, so I've had a lot of top mentors from RevOp, Mass Challenge, uh, help me build decks. I've built about 15. I've raised a million dollars. Um, and I think I've cracked the code on where investors want to end up. I'll also say, I, like many people on here, are hoping I came up with an idea out of nothing that never existed and was able to sell $5 million worth of revenue with it. So, and use that revenue to reinvest and keep building. So I do know a lot about taking an idea and, and, and using resources to put it into action, which is why you guys are here today. So love to answer questions at the end. Um, do you have a rejection meal? They say, if you're not getting rejected, you're not trying hard enough. I really did this uh, rejection meal doesn't help you rebound faster. I just wanted to show you that I believe the first um, slide really needs a catch line uh, when you're doing a pitch deck. When you're doing a pitch deck, there's going to be two types of pitch decks you'll come into. One will be the seven to 11 page pitch deck that you are going to be pitching to places like Mass Challenge. Um, and like with Mass Challenge, I'll give you an example. I was rejected five times. I don't put that in the slide, but from 2013 to 2018, 2014 to 2019, uh, people said stop, but I kept doing it. One, it's great practice, so never stop. If you're still hungry and passionate about what you do, keep doing it, don't listen. And then in 2019, everything changed. I was able to take a better deck, a better approach and go through. And if you ever go through Mass Challenge and it's free to apply, so I definitely recommend it. Uh, 4,200 people go in and you pitch uh, in writing and then you get accepted and you begin to start pitching to some of the most powerful board members, lawyers, professors here in Boston. And 
what that deck is, or when Kiwi Tech and I said I was going around the um, the country pitching, those are generally seven to eleven minute decks, or I should say five to eight minute presentations on seven to eleven pages, and that is the deck I'm going to focus on today. That's the deck when you're actually presenting it to people uh, or emailing it to somebody to really catch their attention. I think you'll see, and I'll talk about it. You really want a good package after that, but it should really have a catch line. Uh, they want to know what they're investing in, what makes it so different, what makes it sexy, uh, why is the market exploding? Uh, they read a lot of them. They go to a, sometimes it's favors. They go to a lot of these and listen. So you want to make them pop their head up and then you want to keep it really simple. So I, I think the problem slide needs to be really early on. Different people uh, have always given me different opinions of this. I would say in your first three slides, after the catch, after just your name and some social proof, you typically want to go to that wake up line and then get right into the problem. You want to tell how big the problem is. Why is it compelling? Uh, and this is another side tip. When you send emails to VC, and I'd recommend if they don't answer to continue to send it, I would drip around the problem in the subject line should be the problem. In the first line of the email should be the problem. Um, you know, if, if you're a fisherman, let's say, um, and, and, and you, and you say the problem is, do you wish you could invite your family out? Well, I have a way to solve motion sickness for anybody that enters a boat, even if they've gotten sick every time before that, it has to be a problem that people can recognize and then want to read more. And then obviously you need to come in with the solution and the solution is who you are. I'll touch upon it. This deck right here um, is just some quick solutions for you as you're going through making your deck. Uh, some quick tips for me. One is uh, you don't want to exceed 20 words per slide. You get one headline, one sentence caption. That's it. Now, when you Google how to make a deck, there'll be a lot of different pieces of advice just like that. Uh, the best piece of advice I receive, though, is before you get into what the deck's going to look like and, and what you're supposed to do around that. And you really want to write one line for each slide. So your catch line and then your problem, right? In one sentence, then your solution, right? In a sentence, maybe three sentences representing three slides, um, financial projections, a sentence. And you want to write what you want the viewer to, to get out of it when they walk away. So again, if your problem is uh, solving motion sickness, you know, the line isn't for that slide. We, uh, you know, um, problem people get motion sick when they get on a boat. That might not be what you want them to walk away with. You might want them to walk away with uh, most family members thinking of going on tuna fishing get sick. Whatever it is needs to be in that sentence of what specifically you want them to walk away with. And then you go back to the slide, you follow the 20 words per slide, you follow the headline phrase. But just remember that if there's one takeaway, it's begin your deck with just one sentence for each slide of what you want on each slide somebody to walk away with. Because it's proven they're, they're only going to walk away with about three to seven things about you. And when that becomes important is when I'm flying around to New York and Chicago and presenting after five, seven, nine people, and then waiting on my inbox to see if anybody's interested in us, I have to keep in mind that during that whole seven minutes I practice, practice, practice for, no matter how great I was or how precise I was, the human brain, they're only going to retain about three to five items. So you want to be very calculated in what the pos or increase the possibility that they walk away with what you're trying to say. And that's how you do it. So that's really the biggest takeaway. The other piece that I'd be happy to on another call um, for those that are interested or, or enjoy this or find this resourceful is, I, and this is where I, I've fallen short in the past and where I wouldn't going ahead is just be ready for the next step. If you're just starting your company now, take pictures of every receipt. Like we're rolling out a new product. So I registered us in Delaware, which means you have to get a registered agent, et cetera, et cetera. Just get it all on paper and begin to work out your PL in the format. And we, I can send you a template, but get it all right so that if they say, yes, we're very interested, the next step is usually, okay, send over your financials or send over your cap table. I can get, 
we can have another call or I can get you a template on cap tables. Uh, once you do a couple there, they're a lot easier to understand, have projections, just so if they ask any of these, you have them. And then if you get it over to them, your chances of closing go up significantly. A great tip when you're talking about your product is a use case. So remember your investor is not a customer. So I make mobile apps for the mortgage industry, right? And I can't expect them to know what a mortgage is. In fact, I think the reason we failed on the first couple pitches of ours uh, with Mass Challenge was I was pitching to a lot of wealthy people, you know, some of the best entrepreneurs in Boston, board members. I didn't realize none of them have actually gotten a mortgage in the last eight years. They pay cash for everything. So learn the hard way that they're not always customers and they don't always get what you think they get. So they don't have any pain around it. These wealthy individuals don't have any pain about how annoying or anxiety driven a mortgage process is because they just show up with a check. So they weren't able to relate. So do a day in the life. It helps them realize. So I should have said, we help banks relate to their customers by making it easier and a more enjoyable process straight from their pocket to close a loan. The result is the people were closing about 20% faster and it was a 15% better retention. So they enjoyed the process so much that 15% more ended up closing. Now, before we existed, they would have to go, instead of taking a picture from their phone, Joe Homebuyer and his wife would have to get in the car together. They would have to go down to Staples. They would have the list. They would pull out all the pay stubs they had. They would open them up. They would put them in the Staples scanner. They would scan them over. Then the person at the bank would have to receive them print them, convert them to a PDF. What you want to do is where they were before, if it's a scenario, any, all of you have scenarios. So what are the pain points and make them believe they're the customer. So they're the bank, right? And now they're listening to this is what your customer has. This is what you put your customer through. And then think of actors versus pronouns. So Joe, the borrower had to go down to Staples and scan it in. Then Joe, the borrower, got a call from your worker, Bill, the loan officer, who couldn't meet this weekend because he had to go on vacation. And so he had to do it in person on Tuesday. But Joe, the borrower, was supposed to go to his kid's basketball game, Susie's basketball game. So think actors. Use, don't, don't use pronouns. If you're solving for a medical industry, doctors, nurses. They're very important. And so what pain points are you solving? And talk about them like you're writing a movie. But again, you also have to follow the brief rule of quick and to the point in the slide. So I like three, as you'll see from this example I have at the end. Why are you unique? Again, writing down what I say that's very important to me is write down each sentence of the three items that you want them to walk away with from your movie that you're telling about the pain points before and, and how you're solving them. Also, remember, show passion. Like they don't know anything about your industry is what I would just assume going in, but they know everything about your competitors. So don't shy away from your competitors. In fact, Google what you do and make sure that you know whoever shows up, even if you don't think they're a competitor, be ready to answer that. They'll be sitting there with their computers these days. And a lot of this pitch is about, are you passionate? Are you unique? Are you, are you unique? Can you get them to feel the pain? Then you solve it. And then be prepared for some of the questions I'll tell you. Um, the team's the team. What I was saying here is, and I've gone to these pitches in Chicago and Washington, D.C., and I get up there and the team is myself, a co-founder who before this was just developing for schools and, and hospitals apps, and another co-founder who's leading you know, a, a regional uh, brokerage shop, which seemed big till we went on the national stage and you know, selling into it wasn't no U.S. bank. And so just don't get insecure with your team. Your team is you. That's your passion. That's your DNA. That is who they're going to be investing in. I always go back and forth on where to put the team slide. Sometimes, you know, do you put it up front? Do you put it? I think right now where I believe it is, is right here. So it's problem, right? Three slides on solution, but all just saying that one sentence. And then this is the team that's going to do it. I show this too, because I was saying when they were doing it, 
you know, those, they have advisory board slides, which have brilliant minds. And then we have these three. So I, I don't think it matters if you have Gary Vaynerchuk as your strategy marketer or your neighbor, Lex, doing creative design. I think you just need to be you. And if you have three of you, I think, you know, having the three people there when you do pitch is important because that's who they're betting on. And again, I think they typically are going to get to the same sort of questions at the end. This is a word you should know, TAM, total addressable market. Um, then the SAM, which is serviceable, a serviceable, available market, which means, um, for example, we sell to loan officers. So the total addressable market is 526,000 loan officers. But many of those loan officers work for Chase, Bank of America, et cetera, right? And Bank of America is obsessed with their Erica app. So until we actually, in our roadmap, build out a product that can go inside their app, they are never going to want another Bank of America app. It's just not the way their CIO thinks. So the total addressable market is 526,000 loan officers, but I want to tell them the serviceable addressable market is 360,000 and that's who we're going to be identifying. So they hate top down like um, homes, right? So uh, millennials are going to buy 10 million homes over the next 10 years, which is going to make up $10 trillion in loan volume. But I don't sell homes. I sell more, I sell mobile apps, right? I don't make 6% commission or 4% commission on these homes. So my addressable market is not $1 trillion. So I, I can't say, if, oh, if we just got 1% of that, or even if they buy you know, one, 10 million homes over the next 10 years, to say if we just got 1% of that, there's, there's no substance to that. Not all the homes are the same. Not everybody's going to get a mortgage. So I think it's very important you do not do top down, but you do know what the word what, what a TAM is helps, but definitely know what total addressable market is. Um, the equation for total addressable market, it's very simple. It's your total customers and the more unique you are about explaining who they are, times price and show your work. That's what they say, like show what you multiply. So say 10 million homes over the next 10 years, we found that 70% of them are single family. So we think we can capture 7 million homes. We charge $6 per closed loan. So 7 million times six, $42 billion is our total addressable market. If I did that right, maybe 42 million, um, 42 million. So they want to know like, why did I choose single family? Well, single family is the type of loan that our traditional borrower uses. Why did I choose millennials? Because anybody under the age of 38 is more likely to use the phone. Whatever it may be, again, it's you're going to be challenged on customers and you're going to be challenged on pricing. Pricing is one of the most frustrating things when you start a company. What do you price your tequila at? I, you know, uh, do you just match what other people are pricing? Is there a reason you're going lower? What does the message say? People are always going to challenge you on pricing. So just make sure that you do your research, find what you believe in and stick to it and be able to explain why. Um, Location, customer definition, product roadmap. When I say location, how many, uh, like I didn't say how many homes are sold in Spain. Um, I didn't say how many homes are sold specifically in Honolulu versus Pittsburgh. But if that was my product, uh, that's what I would do. I'd also say if you're going to start a company and it might be easier to have a total addressable market that you can define well, that doesn't have to be the entire country. And that way, it's easier to explain the next milestone, which we'll get into because a lot of people use time as milestones, why they need money for 18 months. But the next milestone might be moving from Pittsburgh to Pennsylvania. Projections. If you're starting your own company, depending on how long it'll take you to find money, you'll be doing a lot of projections you know, people will be having you do them differently. If you start working with different types of mentors, if you start striking out the advice you get, you know, people will be doing it differently. You'll be living inside Excel. I have I've spent thousands and tens of thousands of hours, I'm sure, uh, doing projections on different Excel sheets. The only thing I can say is uh, keep it honest and 
they don't really like when you show them on these slides, when you show them in Excel and when you show them on slides, both, they're less concerned with how realistic it is. And they're more concerned on how you, how you got there. So they're going to check your math, more concerned about how many homes are in Pittsburgh. And did you go do that research? Did you break down why? Did you break down your pricing and, and, you, and you were able to get there? If that makes sense to them and they, they get how your mind works, they will invest in you. They will, especially on the projections. If you're already making money, um, it's going to be based on growth and then just based on run rate. So if you have a lot of growth fast, you're in a great spot. If you have good revenue and you're okay with three to five times whatever that yearly revenue is for an investment, you're in a great spot. If you haven't made any revenue yet and you're going on projections, again, it doesn't, don't overthink re, real, uh, how realistic it has to be so that you have to hit it. It just has to make sense. Before you guys sign, they'll work with you on, and massage those numbers so it makes sense for them. So show your work. Just think of it like math, you know, in algebra where they used to make sure you weren't cheating. You had to actually write out how you, how you were able to get there. You might have to do it on a deck, uh, uh, the pricing, or immediately after on a follow-up, but just make it simple. Uh, go to market strategies. So this is a good slide too. So again, target what you're looking for and why. I think I've already given this example uh, through my fishing uh, as well as what we do, but this go to markets where you explain a lot of how you got to your TAM. So target, criteria, um, sales cycle. So channels, partnerships. If you get any of those, showcase them. We got to where we were through a co-op called Lenders One. Little side note here. We were able to get into it and they had 270 lenders within there. Look for names like co-op, collaborative in whatever area you're going into. Um, we were able to get in there and they were able to distribute it to their people and help us market it. And that's a lot of where we got the growth that we needed early on to go where we want. It was a lot where we were able to become known enough that when we went to these national conventions and people knew us, we became more comfortable as well. So showcase them. If you get any channel partnerships, the investors know those are easier to work with. Uh, the best thing is any channel partnership with some boots on the ground or some traffic uh, flow to their site and it, it, make sure it's unique and legitimate. If it's just pay for play, um, you might not want it on the, you might not need it on the deck. You might get into it later as a, a line item on use of funds. And then litmus test. If you can show, um, you know, which parts of the criteria in the target market were vetted, um, and which ones worked out really well. And that's why you prioritize it the way you did. It would be great for your market strategy. Uh, always have competition slides, always. If you don't think you have any competition, again, Google what you do. And those are, that's your competition because they're going to bring it up. I find they bring up like the giants, you know, like we're trying to raise 3 million or right now we're trying to raise 5 million. Um, and I'm in the middle of doing it and I'm still switching the deck. So there's really no right answer. If you're looking for a right answer, just YouTube it and find the person you respect the most. And I guess that's the right answer, but you'll get a feel of what you're good at and a feel of what the questions they keep asking. But in my space, they ask blend blend doesn't make any apps for Apple or Google, but they do take an application on a phone. They are in their series F for 125 million. They're up to about $780 million in, in raising money. You'll find the joke. You're like, I just give me three, right? Uh, but they, that sure is, you know, God made green apples. They are going to ask how I compare to blend. So whether I think, you know, they don't make apps, but they are a competitor in that sales cycle for our clients. So one, search the competition, embrace it, enjoy it, and be ready. Um, uh, the next slide, I actually have how I, have seen the best way to do competition slides, um, but don't use the magic quadrants where you have on the X axis, a strength and a weakness in the Y and which corner they're in. Um, one, it shows you only have two strengths and two weaknesses. Um, 
to show different differentiation, uh, differentiation between you and them. But I think a big one is do benefits, not features. So, um, you know, like a feature in our app would be push notifications, right? Um, a benefit of the push notifications would be real-time milestone updates. So again, you want to list your benefits that your product provides. The reason you created the your idea in the first place versus all the features that, that you're able to do. Um, yeah, like if you were... I guess on that boat um, analogy, the benefit might be, you know, no motion sickness up to seven hours. Like time's always good. You want to do them in columns. You want to go left to right. That's how most, you know, you got to assume that they read in, in English and read left to right. You want your logo first. You want the benefits on the left. Again, time is good, as you said, as you saw, I said it, but here, load time less than a second. All of these on the left are benefits, not features that um, they're able to do, right? Um, and then you want check marks on what you're able to do. If you're too close, then you can use like circles and say 70%, 80%, 20%. But this is the best competition slide you can have and always have a competition slide. And if you can go features, uh, sorry, benefits over features, I think you're now getting ahead of the other people that you're, you're pitching against. All right. When you demonstrate the idea, I would stay away from video. I've used video too. So it is, you know, you get proud of that video. Sometimes it describes it better, but it definitely decreases the chances of them saying yes. There's too many outside factors. If it's not received well, you can't stop it once it starts. Uh, you kind of just stand there. So if you are going to do it, I would say practice, 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 practice everything. So if you are going to play and get uncomfortable with your own voice and your own look, like that's another key. So if you're going to play a video for four minutes and 30 seconds, look at yourself in the mirror during that whole four minutes and 30 seconds, get comfortable with how you're going to look at them while they're watching the video. Or are you going to turn and watch the video? I just stay away from videos. But some people like the way it shows their product. Again, I would stay away from them. Um, use the record feature on the phone. So anytime I went to Kiwi Tech and did those presentations, one, it was in front of a lot of people, but record and keep saying it so that you're not reading. And, and if you put in enough time for this deck, I think you'll start to understand. If you put in enough time to travel to Austin, Texas, just to pitch in the money, don't cheat yourself out of not practicing and, and being precise, uh, especially if it costs you money and it's about your business and something that you've put in and it's an opportunity that you were able to get for yourself. Know what every single second of that is. And mostly because you got to respect the time limit. There's so, more people go past the time limit than don't, but you have to respect the time limit. If you have eight minutes to pitch, pitch in eight minutes. It, it's so key. The lack of self-awareness, if you go over it, you're not going to get any money unless you're brilliant. And that's why you don't realize times and you've just created something that everybody wants. When I used to pitch, I was in the same circle with this guy that went over for like 12 minutes, like no clue. But he had this like laser gun that if you shot it at anything, it could do anything. So like, it, and he had Air Force contracts. I was like, why am I even up against this guy? Like this is... Like you could shoot it at marijuana and it would tell you the THC value. And so he was trying to say the pain point was that the, what they have in police cars to do this was 28,500 and it's so heavy, it sits in a trunk and you can't lift it. And then his gun can, can tell you that, or you could put the gun in the airplane. It can go over crops and tell the uh, iron amount and corn crops. And then people would ask questions and he's like, oh, it can do that, it can do that. So if you have a magic laser gun, then you don't have to respect the time limit. But if you don't have one of these and you're like me, just come prepared, practice, practice, practice till you have the whole thing memorized and put it in the record, play it back. And you'll be really surprised. Either you're going too long, talking too fast, too slow, and just keep doing it till it, you hear yourself enough, put the headphones on and just keep doing it. 
that's the advice everybody skips. Like, I, I do it. So pricing, revenue model. Like I said, you got to show in the P&L format is the best way to show. You'll see different opinions of this. Um, I have a slide after this to show you, but using three zeros, unless you guys are killing it, then you can use six zeros, but uh, that makes it a lot easier to see and understand. Um, find a KPI to show traction. So in this, you'll see users. For me, it would be maybe banks or credit unions we've signed up. Um, show headcount. Headcount shows how many people you're going to hire, right? And, and again, when you see these projections, it's less about like time. So time is not a milestone. A milestone is usually going to be that revenue number you see uh, at the top. And so the headcount shows that you understand how you, your business needs to run as revenue increases, that you understand their sales cycles, that you're aware it's an eight month sales cycle. If it's an eight month sales cycle, that you're aware customer service in the mortgage industry where they prefer pizzas and Panera bread might be more hands-on even in software than it needs to be. But you know, if you're making uh, an alternative to PowerPoint and you you don't really need anybody except money to pay for chat bots to, or uh, BPO outsource it to handle those questions. So show that you know your industry through that headcount. And then the cash line here down at the bottom, cash is different for many different reasons, but there's accrual counting and cash accounting uh, in SaaS, like, which is software as a service. Pete, you want people to pay annual more upfront, but sometimes you will document it on your uh, P&L as accrual, which means I don't actually document it as all revenue today. I, I allocate it over the next 12 funds. So what they're looking at, at is cash and it's okay to be negative in cash. Who isn't at some points? That's why you're there asking for money, right? Like if I didn't need cash, I, I wouldn't be here. And so they're okay seeing that. And they, and when they see the rest, and if one of these lines makes sense, they want to move forward with you. EBITDA, you'll hear all the time, but it's earnings before interest, um, taxes, depreciation. And it's basically profit. So um, that line in there is, is typically your profit. So they want to see what your expenses are going to be, your sales, your, and, uh, and put that all together. The only thing I'll add is they want to see you know your expenses. Like the revenue, the sales, they believe in you. Those are the milestones that you guys are going to be talking about. That's the investment. But you, you need to know your expenses. That's what they're relying on you for. That's where your expertise is. So again, we can share this deck or I can just get you um, whatever Ed says you guys need, but that slide is an easy one to follow. Uh, the investment you need, just make sure you know the vernacular, uh, pre-funding, pre-valuation, post-valuation, what is your value? They're always gonna ask you what your value is. Just be confident with it. Totally different if you're already making money versus not making money. Um, totally different if you're on an upswing versus a not upswing. So it's the amount of money you need to get to the next milestone. And I can't stress that enough. And I would say work your way back in this whole thing called entrepreneurship. Like, okay, you're going to create a company, but really like what is the next milestone from when you're going to go out and get money? And time's not it. Like we need an 18 month runway. So it needs to get to the next goal. For us, our competitor has 200 clients that worth $75 million. We're at 24. So really our next milestone is we need $5 million to get 200 clients. We believe we can get it. Are you on board? Because I of X, Y, and Z. So there's different goals along the way. You guys can have product roadmap, geographic roadmap on how you're going to reach those milestones. Um, yeah, the features versus benefits, we're back to that. This actually means a different definition now. Uh, features have been up till now, features of your, your company, let's say. At this point, you're selling equity, right? So you got to tell them what are the benefits of, of giving you the money? what are the benefits of them having equity in your company? That's really what you're doing. 
So at this point, I think in the presentation, you want to switch to starting to tell the benefits of what you do. A slide that they recommend is actually at the very end, slicing it in half and saying the milestones you've accomplished already. And look, it, don't be afraid if your milestone is, I did a focus group and did a survey of 25 people. And this is lean startup, Eric Reese, right? Uh, 12 people said they, they wanted it. That might be a milestone, right? And then your ask is, is where you, your ask is really a bunch of milestones of where you're going. Um, so I have a slide here. It's um, for Cremico. They are out of Portland, Oregon. They raised three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in seed money. What's kind of cool about this slide, and to me, this doesn't really get into. Um, this is the part that distracts you. I think this slide is too Silicon Valley fancy. Like if it was this easy, um, but you needed to be graphically like this uh, perfect or elegant, then I think that's what gets you that writer's block. So it's not this easy, but what they, I did wanna show, like look at the benefits they talk about. Look at how they talk about month over month growth Look at how they talk about um, the cost of acquisition, the lifetime value of a customer, um, the potential, um, the killer features. Um, and it really doesn't have any fluff, even though it looks like a lot of sort of fluff. So here it is. And kind of to recap what we went over. But the first slide is your company slide. This might not even count in your head as the first slide of the deck. Oh. Hold on, it's saying it's paused. So you guys probably can't see this. All right, now you can. Okay, um, where are we at? Okay, we better finish up, jeez. Um, so real quick, uh, you're always gonna have a slide of your company up there while you're shuffling around waiting to present. So you do need one of your company, Look at down here, social proof. If you have some social proof, always helps. If not, just mission statement, what you do. This was the, the catchy uh, vision of where you're going or where the market's going. This is the problem. So they get right into the problem. Shows the demand, but you can't get what you need. And then this is how they solve it. Michael, I can't see the screen. Uh, okay. The, the VC people or the private equity people are sitting down. So um, it just has the tagline. Always need your elevator pitch ready, your tagline, your mission statement. Have those, write those out. Always know those because if somebody asks them and you don't know them, you already lose credibility. It has social proof, a little bit harder to, to get, but there's certainly ways that if you get mentioned in any article, like me with Forbes, you know, in, in our company being mentioned, you can now have social proof with it. I was just saying that this is the vision slide. So this is sort of getting people to wake up, uh, as I told you. Like there's a revolution. Um, quick, another quick tip. If you're looking for, if you have writer's block on big words to say, always shop for, uh, always go to Amazon top selling books a lot, any of those titles of books are amazing ways to get maybe the words you need to, to open up some eyes. You can also search um, Google Magazine and find magazines that are in your space. If they're still around today, if people are still able to go and pay money for uh, you know a piece of paper to read for a couple hours and they're willing to pay $8, $6, 
they're obviously doing something right with catching attention. So that's another place to look for words like revolution. Um, here's the problem. Okay. They're going to explain it, but this is what it's up on the screen. I get it. Looks like there's a big problem here. You can't get any of the good coffee and they make it easy to subscribe to the top coffee. So they're going to write like, what do they want me to walk away with? To me, it seems like there's more coffees out here than I thought. And there's a, there's a way I can get into this market. This is how I get into the market. This is what happens when I get into the market. And this is a little extra cherry on top culture part of it, right? Their special sauce, what makes them unique about how they do it or how I feel after they did it. This is the TAM. This is what we talked about with their go-to-market strategy. There's an actual target market, a niche, right? They boiled it down. This is their team. These are the people I'm betting on. Hopefully they were both there talking during it. So that, again, I think, you know, be prepared for who you're presenting to. I think in that case, that's a little bit more of a romantic way to pitch. A lot of times you will need a little bit more um, substance, but I'll share that and I can share. Um, what I'll do is, Ed, I'll get you a couple uh, decks that you can send out to people. Yeah, that, but that, one will, that one will be included. Um, and yeah, so if there's any questions, I don't know if people want to type them in, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, I think we got about 10 minutes left. So I'm sure there's a bunch of people with some questions. So, um, and I'm starting to see them bringing them on right now. So uh, let's uh, kind of go one by one, if you will. I saw Katie uh, yeah. with a question. So why don't we just start it off? So one question, should you include differences between your company and your competitors in the slide? How much of the financial should you be ready to discuss during the pitch? So uh, great questions. Yeah, I would definitely include the differences between the company and the competitors. They're going to ask you what makes you unique. So that is the answer to the question, but I would do it in what benefits you have versus what features you have. So when I said we can from a mobile device, take a picture without it hitting the camera roll and get it directly into their system, that's a feature. The benefit would be you can uh, customers now from their phone can securely get any piece of paperwork into the banking system. Whether that rocks your world or not, in the next one, the competitor won't have that check mark, right? So that's a benefit that I have for, for my customers' customers that, that they don't have. As far as the financials, yeah, be ready to go. Ed can set up another one. We can talk about that. But I think that's the biggest piece is that they're not going to talk about it in front of everybody because they want to get out of there usually. So they're going to ask you just about like, how did you come to that pricing, right? Do you have any opportunity to charge more? They're going to ask you um, the math. So you got to show that simple math of how many customers are out there. Be prepared to talk about that. Don't, you don't have to talk about headcount. They're not going to get into headcount. They're not going to trip you up on questions like uh, any tricky stuff except EBITDA. Know what that is. It's um, pretty much after all your costs, you know, how much, how much money are you uh, earning at the end of each month or, or year? I would even say, um, oops, how do I go? I would even say this is a good format here for if people are wondering on months and then year breakdown for financials. So I would definitely screen grab this or, or copy this, or I got it from somewhere. So I, I'll get you guys the source of it as well. Um, Great. Most Thank exposure you. I have to hearing investor pitches is from Shark Tank to practice building pitching skills more intentionally while watching. What are the key elements that you look for in a pitch that I could start to look for and learn from? Yeah, one like Shark Tank is seven hours of pitching and then they show you they show you a chopped up version of it. So that's not realistic. They could mess up. Just if you YouTube it, like um, YouTube like New York. Yeah, less mainstream stuff. Like watch people mess up, watch people do good, watch people go over the time constraints. Just watch a lot. I mean, YouTube has so many of them. Just watch like... New York tech star. Don't watch like San Francisco tech stars. That's only gonna be the best. Watch like 
Atlanta, New York, Boston, uh, Piranha Sharks, and, and watch some people pitch. And that'll get you um, an idea of what it's really like out there. And I would say, like, don't be – don't let anybody else's pitch affect your mojo when you go up there because they don't know your industry like, like you do. So no matter how good they are, better than me they are, they don't know the mortgage industry, especially in mobile. So I shouldn't let the outside noise affect how I go up there and rock it because I worked very hard for what I did. And I, I, you know, I always get intimidated by people's advisory boards and I'm like, uh Oh, I'm going up there with three, but they don't know my space. And if that's a problem that the, the investors are looking for, then this person that pitched, that's the kind of cool part about pitching. You're not really pitching against the same people in your space. So like, I don't believe you can't fail. I would say, in fact, to learn, Start pitching and actually start pitching to uh, angel investors because that cycle takes nine to 12 months. So once you get going, you can talk yourself out of these angel clubs because it'll, it'll take too long to get the money. And I'm sure Ed can expand on that, but it's, it's technically easier because they'll mentor, fall in love, try and help you if they believe in it. They diversify their money because it's like 25,000 from each person. They're local. So like here in Boston, there's a big one up in Andover. The only con to it is you got to pitch a lot and it takes like 12 months for them to get comfortable with it. So that's the best place to start practicing there um, before you're actually concerned about all the time you're spending on business versus pitching. Cause that's the other part. They say like bootstrap as long as possible because pitching becomes a full-time job and it's hard to work on your company and pitch at the same time. What, any other questions, Ed? Yeah, well, we're just uh, short on time, so let's uh, just a couple more. Uh, what are the top big changes you had to make uh, to make it to Mass Connect in your fifth attempt or Mass Challenge, fifth attempt? Yeah, I would say um, the biggest change was working on the deck, and getting the deck from something that I thought to using mentors and actually getting a deck that matched what they were looking for. Um, I didn't practice what I'm preaching to you guys now. I didn't really YouTube. Um, I got overwhelmed. I got frustrated. I got stuck many times and I would just go with what's comfortable. And so I'd say, don't worry about the look. Like if you subscribe for like 20 and, and always spend money on small things to save you time. So like Invanto is what, $29.99 and it gives you templates for any sort of deck you want. So just start with writing what you're trying to get through on each, on each slide. And don't worry about what it looks like. And then you can go to Advanto and it's, it'll be made and you can just choose a template. So don't get stuck on, that's where I mostly get stuck is like trying to find the right images. And I mean, you saw from this deck, it's not my specialty, but um, you'll find somebody that'll work for you or have passion that can help you if that's something that you need. So to answer your question, I, I made the deck the way I spoke about it today. And yeah, it went from 4,200 down to 25. And every time was in front of the best of the best in Boston, as far as who donate their time. Love the questions. If you guys have any questions, like I, I, I think with me, you'll hear it's real and how many times I've been rejected. And, and then, you know, we, we've been offered money and said, no, we should have. And we've been offered money and didn't make sense and we've been denied many times too it's always like a college um you know we really liked you but we have to regretfully we had so many good people apply we had to choose our top so well thanks michael this has been truly amazing i really you know i really think we uh gotta see a different side to i think the the pitching you know the i think a lot of us see the the shark tank a lot and not really see what's it like from um, someone from your, you know, your position. So I thought, uh, you know, what you had was really great. It would be great if you could maybe share with us like a PDF or something of, of your deck. And so I can yep. share it with the recipients. I think they would really benefit from that. Uh, I would like to, you know, thank all the, uh, everyone who uh, attended today for your time. Really appreciate it. We'll be having more of these uh, workshops uh, coming up. We'll, Definitely be asking Michael to come back soon uh, to share stuff on uh, financing and such. But um, you know, just keep uh, keep a lookout for our future emails. We do workshops once a month. 
Um, we have uh, an incubator and accelerator program. So if there is interest in taking idea, qualifying it and being put into a position where you can actually start pitching, uh, you know, one of your, you know, uh, solutions, um, come look out for me or uh, anyone on our intent team. Uh, so Michael, thank you so much for your time today. Really do appreciate it. Um, and, you know, thank you all and uh, have a good rest of the week. Yeah, I'll just say those kind words are, are why I do it. So thank you for whoever wrote in the um, the chat. That was uh, awesome. You guys made my day. So thank you. You made ours, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Be well.